I am a singer-songwriter, originally from Boston, Mass. I live in Brooklyn now. And today I'm going to sing a bunch of songs and tell you the stories behind why I wrote those songs. But first, I'm going to sing the full version of that song yes. you guys heard me do on Idol. Oh, Guys are crying, I am watching, catching teardrops in my veins. Only silence as it's ending, like I never had a chance. Do you have to? to not tell anybody that I had been cut. So for three months of my life, every person I had ever met was congratulating me with joy on their face about how proud they were for something I had already failed at. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. It was supposed to be the most exciting three months of my life, and I was devastated. I was anticipating disappointing every person I had ever met. 
And every week would go by and I would make it further on the show. So that would just more convince everyone in my life that I was definitely gonna win. And the show aired on like Wednesday mornings. And so I would wake up to like 100 text messages every Wednesday from what felt like everyone I knew being like, oh my God, this is so exciting. We're having a viewing party. We love you. We're proud of you. American Idol is the best thing that's ever happened to you. And the knot in my stomach will get worse. And finally, we get to the week where I know I'm about to be caught on national television. Nobody else knows that. And I'm sitting in my living room. And the dread I was feeling, it's difficult to describe. And I see myself walk across the TV. And they're like, better luck next time. It was a shock cut. And all of a sudden, the whole world knew how much of a failure I actually was. But I think you guys can probably guess a little bit better than I could at the time what happened next. Those same people that had texted me that morning <coughs> that American Idol was the best thing to ever happen all texted me within five minutes something along the lines of this. <sighs> well, American Idol is stupid and the voice is better. No one even watches American Idol anymore. And you don't need them. And you're better off without them. We love you and we're proud of you. Because obviously, the people in my life did not love me because of American Idol. They loved American Idol because of me. But I had built so much pressure in my own head that I wasn't able to enjoy that experience. I was only able to see that experience through the lens of my own pressure I had created for myself. And it got me thinking about what else in my life I had avoided doing, what risks I had avoided taking, because I was afraid of failing in front of everyone. Because I failed on national television in front of millions of people and nobody but me noticed. <coughs> Like, I don't think I, that video got played and you guys turn to your friends and were like, yeah, I hear she's the name of when. Like, who is, no one is mean enough to me other than me to think those thoughts. And it brought me back to the song that I wrote when I was in the seventh grade. Um, I wrote this song, it's called Little Girl. And it was right around the seventh grade where everyone else stopped saying they wanted to be a singer when they grew up. I was still saying that. But everyone else had moved on to more reasonable goals. And I started to get really insecure about what I wanted to do with my life. And the beginning of this song is it's about a little girl who's a dancer. And when she first starts dancing, she just dances because she loves to. But the older she gets, the less it becomes about her love for dance and the more it becomes about other people's reaction. And thinking about it after Idol, the middle of the song is how I felt before Idol. It was the fear that I would try and I would fail and everybody would see. But the end of the song, which is crazy because I wrote it when I was in the seventh grade, the end of the song is how I feel now, which is the, tr the worry that I'll grow up and get old and I wouldn't have truly tried and I wouldn't know what could have happened if I had. Um, so this song's called Little Girl. I hope you like it. Little girl, she's turning five and she don't know where to start. All she knows is her whole life she's got dancing in her heart. And as she turns, the world seems to go away. Everything is nice. She spins and spins till she's falling into the dream she has at night. And she says, on your face, I know it's gonna be okay. The world is just too big, I know. But as you spin, let it go. Hey, 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 I'm okay. Hey, 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 Little girl. But she knows she has to try 
So his family gets together, and my family gets together around the kitchen table, and I'm singing the song, and I'm crying, or parents are crying, or siblings are crying, and he's 12 at this point. Play the song, and he, uh, the song ends, and he goes, yeah, I mean, it was fun in school, I don't, I don't really care, it's fine. And then he went and played Xbox, like a very standard 12 year boy response. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess it's not as big of a deal as I thought. And I went to my room and I recorded it and put it on YouTube and the video is actually still there. That's what I used to do with songs. I was just like, make a video, put it online. And I didn't really think much of it. But it was a few days later and I needed to borrow his laptop or something. So I opened up his laptop and his iTunes was up. And I saw that he had gone to YouTube, found the video, downloaded the audio, and listened to it 200 times in two days. And I sat on the floor of his bedroom and I cried. And that's the day I decided to become a professional songwriter um, because he was really lost. He was really, really isolated. And he couldn't even tell me how much that song meant to him. But you could tell he must have fallen asleep listening to it. And so this is my favorite song I've ever written. Uh, this song is called Enough, and it goes out to anybody in the audience who feels like some days people don't understand how hard it is to be you. Here we go. Thank you. 
didn't listen to his haters. He shook it off, he moved on. But that has not been my experience of how this works. The thing that drives me absolutely crazy is that I know who said the things to him that still replay in his mind 10 years later. These kids walk around my hometown, and I know if I went up to them, I was like, hey, do you remember so-and-so from middle school? They'd all be like, oh yeah, how's he doing? He's such a good kid. None of them remember, because they didn't wake up one morning, like stretch it out, be like, oh, you know what I'm gonna do today? I think I'm gonna ruin the sick kid's life. That's what I'm gonna do. Nobody does that. Nobody casts themselves as the bully in their own heads. These kids were just normal, insecure 12 year olds, and they were feeling insecure at school. They looked for an easy target. He was the easiest of targets. They thought of something funny to say in one second. They said it in one second. They felt better, they felt superior, and they walked away. But he didn't get to walk away. Because sometimes people say rough things. And those words come and they hit your heart and they bruise your heart and they bounce off. And those bruises stay there and they hurt, but they fade eventually. But some of us are walking around with all this pressure on our shoulders. And for my friend, nobody knew what he, the pressure he was under. But that pressure was down and down and down until his heart cracked open. There were little openings in his heart. And when those words came at him, instead of bouncing off and hurting him, they went inside. And they lived there for the next 10 years and have affected the way that he sees himself. And I had my own experiences with that kind of thing. You know, my, my bullying was much more standard. It's what you might see in a Netflix rom-com. I was, um, I went to like a public middle school and there were the stereotypical, typical, stereotypical popular girls. I was not one of them. Um, they all wore, I'm going to date myself here, they wore head to toe Abercrombie and Fitch, which was very in in 2001. Um, they all straightened their hair the same way and they all wore the same amount of intense makeup and they were all very pretty. I wore all of my clothes from Kohl's and wore these lime green uh, sweatpants that I thought were very cool. They zipped up, I thought they were awesome. Um, and they did not like me one bit. And I was lucky that they were very direct with me as to why that was. They informed me that I was weird and gross. And I was like, well, thank you for that information. It's very useful. Um, you know, and I, I honestly, in the scheme of things, unlike my family friend, I was lucky. I had a lot of friends. I did a lot of stuff after school. I just was really unliked by the popular kids. And these girls, they would like walk down the hallway like in a yeast formation, do you know what I mean? Like, kind of like one cutting the front and they would flank her on the sides and I'd be at my locker and like opening the locker and trying to like hide behind the locker and be like, please don't notice me, please don't notice me. And they would just kind of walk by like, you know, in the, in the look that they did in their flank and most days were fine. Some days really weren't. <laughs> and one of those days that really wasn't fine um, was this, this time that I, I went to my first boy and girl dance in middle school. So I was on the student council, so I actually helped plan this. Now, where's the seventh grade at? Nice, okay, guys. Ooh. Eighth grade, you'll have your moment. Okay. So this was in the seventh grade, and it was incredibly romantic. It was at 4.30 in the afternoon in the cafetorium, so like, amazing. Um, but we were all, so excited. I had been planning this. I was on the student council, so I've been planning this dance for like a month. And I got a new dress from Target. I was looking fly or as fly as I could. I, you know, doing my best, living my best life. And I, we, I go to the dance with my friends. We try to 
geese, geese fly and Lily put in, so we just walked in. And um, it was pretty predictable. Uh, there's about 200 kids in my grade, and the, I know, public school, man. Um, the boys were all the way down there. And the girls were all the way down there. And the boys were like throwing french fries at us, and that is as close as we were getting to interacting with one another. Because it was so awkward, nobody knew what to do. And so every year, the dance was so awkward. And so the teachers would do like an icebreaker at the beginning of the dance, just to, you know, make us more comfortable. Unfortunately for me, the icebreaker that the teachers picked my year was, um, they decided to teach us how to ballroom dance. Yeah, you see where this is going. It's not in well. So, so guys, obviously nobody was going to ask each other to dance. That is so embarrassing. And so the teacher lined us up in two rows and went down with like you with you and you with you all the way down. So as you can imagine, it was very uncomfortable. We were all just standing there like waiting for our fates to be sealed and just like giggling. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe Tasha's a dark. That's so embarrassing. And it's always a dark. And they finally get to me. They finally get to me and she goes, yeah, I went And she pairs me with this normal guy. It was in my grade. I didn't really think much of it. Um, but it was at that moment, in front of my entire brain, that my peer, my fellow peer, took the opportunity to loudly proclaim in front of the entire dance, ew, she's gross, I won't dance with her. Uh, yeah, rough. no, I wasn't coming, um, at the time. Um, so the whole bridge stopped, gets completely silent, turns to look at me and bursts out laughing. And normally I'm the kind of person that when someone's mean to me, I'm like, whatever. And then I might cry in the bathroom where they can't see me. But this time was not one of those times. I was honestly shocked. And I burst into tears and like fled the dance, like bad Netflix movie, just, and, and I'm gonna date myself again here. I didn't have a cell phone. So I had to go to the front office and call my mom on a landline. And I was like, Mom, you go get me. She's like, isn't it 445? I was like, yes. And I sat on the curb of my middle school in my brand new party dress from Target, crying hysterically. So my mom pulls up in our pink minivan. She's also filling it. And it's not going to shock you guys that I was a very dramatic child, prone to theatrics, one might say. Um, but this was different. My mom had never seen me this kind of devastated. I honestly thought that they were right. And I turned to my mom in that car ride home and I begged her to teach me how to put on makeup. Because all of those girls, all of the pretty girls in my school, they wore the same clothes and they did their hair the same way and they wore a ton of makeup and I thought, fine, fine. If that's what I need to do to be left alone, absolutely sign me up. And I put my mom in a really tough position because she had two choices. She could have been like, no, makeup is not the answer. She'd be like, you just go back in there and tell them that your mother told to say to them. And it would have been a, di a disaster. <laughs> or, that is what my mom sounds like, too. Um, <laughs> or, she could give me those lessons, that armor. Because that is how I view makeup for a very long time. Like, armor against that happening to me again. And I tell you that story. Um, because of this next song that I'm going to sing, this song is called Beautiful, and I wrote this song when I was 17. So, I actually went to a boarding school to get away from the kids I went to middle school with, uh, and I went to a boarding school full of dorky people, and so I fit right in, and I made lots of dorky friends, and I thought I had left that behind me. 
I thought the words had bruised me and bounced off. But it turns out that they had actually worked their way in, and they were still living in my head, and they were still affecting the way I saw myself because I was on my way to the gym at 17 years old in high school, and before I left for the gym, I put on makeup, which I did every time I went to the gym. I actually did that every time I left my house. But this one time, I was like in the mirror, and I stopped, and I saw myself. I had this thought, just like, well, when did this happen? Because that elementary school kid with good snacks was not putting on makeup before going out outside. That was a learned behavior I had developed since then. And I went back to this memory of that middle school dance and how horrible it was. And I sat down and I wrote this song. And this song is about as close to my diary as you're gonna get. This song starts with me being your age and thinking that if I were just prettier, I would be accepted. And then it goes to high school, the age I was when I wrote the song, and I thought if I were just prettier that my life would be easier, the boys that I liked would like me back. And the end of the song was me thinking about what it must have been like to be my mom, sitting in that car, watching her happy, loud, smart daughter cry because a boy had called her ugly. So the song's called Beautiful. Um, I hope you like it. I'm staring in the mirror, wondering what I could do better, wondering how I could be anyone but me. Cause I'm 13 and the other kids are so mean Why do they not like me? Why do they not like me? I hear the bell, I'm a bell And it hurts, but what's worse Is when they don't see me at all I got my lipstick in my head so I just Thank you. 
You know, and I want to be clear, this is not an anti-makeup assembly. I did not wake up like this. This makeup is much too fresh for that. Um, you know, it's more like I realized that when I was, when I was the age where I wrote this song, I used makeup to feel less gross. Now I use it to feel fabulous. And it's not fair to wear it off. And it's the same makeup. But it's a very different outcome. And, you know, I think it's a lot harder for us not to compare ourselves to others than it was for our parents because of social media. And I love social media. It is awesome. I'm on Instagram all the time. We're all addicted to our phones. Um, but you know, when our parents, when our parents didn't get invited to a party on Friday night, they did not find out until Monday morning. And instead, we open up our phone and see 85 Snapchats from everybody who's there. And I realized like every week, right, we're all exhausted by the time Friday comes around. Oh, it's Friday, isn't it? Yay, fun. Um, and all I dream about every Friday night is climbing into my bed, watching Netflix, and eating Nutella. Because I feel like I deserve the final thing. But every time that I do that, every time that I make that fantastic decision, I also make the bad decision of opening up Instagram. And all I see are stories of everybody having this so much fun. Everyone's like, oh my god, look at us. Oh my god, besties. Oh my god, so much fun. We're having more fun than you. And I start to doubt my amazing, amazing decision making. I start to be like, oh god, should I go outside? I don't want to go outside. I want to be inside. And I, I should never doubt my decisions to watch The Office with the 10,000 time around. I do this just that, and I realized that I was also doing that with my career. I am a musician, and all my friends are musicians, and it's really awesome, because all my friends are really successful musicians, and they're always posting about how great their jobs are, and when I'm in a good place, I'm very happy for that. And then sometimes I'm feeling insecure, and I open up Instagram, and it's full of everybody living their fabulous careers, and I'm like, oh no. Am I not doing enough? And I have this friend in Nashville that I always have that reaction to. Her career is awesome and she's killing it. And I was catching up with her in Nashville a couple months ago. And we were, at, we were at coffee and out of the blue, she says to me, honestly, like, it's so great that you go to school with something. I love it. It's just like, oh my gosh, I see it and like, it makes me so anxious. Like, I'm not doing enough. And like, you're just like really killing it. Like, I, I feel like I need to step up. And I realized, that she was comparing herself to me the same way I was comparing myself to her. And the truth is, is that like, when she is doing something fabulous and posting about it, she's all the way up here. And I'm never on my phone when I'm like having fun. I'm on my phone when I'm bored. So I'm like down here and I'm doing laundry. And I look at her and I go, oh my God, look how far away, look how above me she is. And then simultaneously, when I'm doing something awesome, like I don't know plan for you lovely people, I'm all the way up here, baby. I'm all the way on top. And she's bored because she's looking at her phone. We only look at her phone when we're bored. And she looks at this and goes, look how far above me she is. And really the truth is, is that we're both around here. But the inherent flaw of social media is that you only post when you're fabulous and you only look at it when you're bored. And so it causes us all to think everyone else's lives is so much better.
that I did a bunch of laundry to get to here. And then if you look at it, that's awesome. I want to share with you awesome stuff, but know that there was like 20 loads of laundry and homework and flights and, and delays and everything that happens to make a career happen was all really boring to get to that point post that I posted on Instagram. And I do not have a song about Instagram yet. Um, you know, I'll let you know when, when I find a way to make that work. Um, but I just thought it was really important to talk about that. And, you know, you guys have been amazing. It looked like you were having a, a really fun time outside. I almost joined in, but I'm wearing heels. Um, I just have one more little story, and then we're going to do some fun stuff. Um, do you guys remember the East Girls that I talked about? Yes. Uh, hashtag East Girls. Uh, so, <laughs> that would be such a better hashtag for me. Um, so I went to boarding school to, to have a new social experience in high school than different from the one that I had in middle school. And I made all new friends there. And then I went to Berkeley College of Music, which is this big music college in, in Boston, and I made all new friends there. And then I went on American Idol. Woo! And as stressful as Idol was, the day that that audition aired on TV was super exciting. Uh, we had like all my friends, we packed all my friends in my tiny apartment, and we got pizza and champagne, and every time my face came on the TV, we like screamed, and it was really exciting. And my friend, funnily enough, the girl from Nashville, she was in Nashville, so she wasn't watching with us in Boston, but she was watching uh, herself, and she texted me during, during the airing, she was like, girl, you better get on Twitter. You were like trending on Twitter right now. And I was like, what? And I ran into my phone, ran into my room and got on my phone. And I'm scroll scrolling through Twitter, through these like hundreds of tweets. And it was the first time the internet has ever been polite. It's just a bunch of people being like, what a lovely young lady. I'm like, I hope she's well. I picture them with British accents that may be inaccurate. Um, <laughs> but it was all these people saying all this really kind stuff about my music. It was so exciting. And, I'm scrolling, and I pause, like my, my subconscious recognized something, and I scrolled back up, and I have the receipts for this. I found an entire subtweet conversation about myself between the mean girls that I went to middle school with that I had not talked to in eight years, and it went a little something like this. Oh my God. Casey McCrone is so gross. If she wins American Idol, I'm gonna throw up. I know, she's like not even that good of a singer. I know, and doesn't she look ugly in that outfit? So I was shocked. And do you wanna know what I did? I burst out laughing and showed all my new friends that were celebrating for me outside. Because I Okay, so I'm gonna sing this song. You all know this song. 
different things. And the chorus is you're gonna sing along because guess what? This is your only opportunity to sing incredibly loudly at school, and I'm gonna get yelled at instead of you. So I heard your musical bunch. Let's start it off like this. Guys, it has my social media information, my email, my DM. You guys can hit me up. How does that sound?